First, let me just say thank you for being a member of my inner circle. This is a big week for Republicans. Governor DeSantis officially entered the White House race on Wednesday. Before that, Senator Tim Scott entered the race. Scott, in some ways, had a very impressive start. He had Senator Thune there, who is one of the senior Republicans from South Dakota, endorsing him. He had a number of very successful people helping him. And he has sufficient resources that Scott launched a $6 million ad campaign in Iowa and New Hampshire. So he's going to be a serious player. DeSantis had a little bit of a rocky start by relying on Elon Musk and Twitter. And for whatever reason, Twitter melted down, which got DeSantis on the one hand, a lot of bad coverage. On the other hand, it got him coverage. He raised a lot of money the first day. I would say that there was a pretty big wave of support for his candidacy coming out of that, despite the confusion of the initial launch. At the same time, you can tell there's a vacuum there that DeSantis has not filled. And now there's talk that Governor Glenn Youngkin of Virginia is really beginning to rethink whether or not he'll run. He had turned it down early on because he's a brand new governor. But the vacuum is so big, and Youngkin has access to so many people of real wealth coming out of his background at the Carlisle Group that he at least has to think seriously about that. This is in a situation where you still have Vice President Pence, you have Ambassador and Governor Nikki Haley, who is in the race. You have Vivek Ramaswamy, who actually is doing surprisingly well for somebody who's never run for public office. So the Republican race is going to remain interesting. And of course, the big figure in that, as Harvard poll just reported again this morning, is Donald Trump, who is at 58% against everybody. So he will be formidable, although there's some evidence that DeSantis, at least, is willing to take him head on and have a real debate. When we think presidential races, you have to recognize that Biden appears weak half the time, appears confused a quarter of the time, is already the oldest person to be president. He would be 86 at the end of a second term if he were to win re-election. And interestingly, Hillary Clinton, in an interview with the Financial Times, encouraged voters to contemplate Biden's age, saying, quote, his age is an issue and people have every right to consider it. That was not exactly helpful to Biden, and we'll see what it leads to. But I personally believe the odds are at least even money he will not be the Democratic nominee, whether because he pulls out or because he loses to Robert Kennedy or somebody. But I just have a feeling that you can't have his extraordinarily bad polling numbers if they continue at this level of only a third of the country supporting him. Well, a third means you could potentially get beat two to one. So it's a challenge, although Biden currently still is well ahead among Democrats. In fact, one poll showed him with 65% of the Democrats compared to Robert Kennedy Jr. and Marianne Williamson, who each got 11%. The one advantage Robert F. Kennedy Jr. may have is that one of the early races is New Hampshire, and in the New Hampshire primary, as a Massachusetts native, he may have an advantage. The border remains a total disaster. It's going to be a continuing problem because this administration is so determined to have an open border. And I think you're going to see more and more steps taken by the Biden administration to weaken our border control and to continue to have an increased number of people flooding into the U.S. On the debt ceiling, everybody is in the middle of an argument. I personally do not believe that there is any likelihood that June 1st is a really hard deadline because a lot of taxes come in on the 15th of June and the Treasury can balance things off and I suspect could actually last at least into July and maybe into August. But that just gives them breathing room to get the legislation done. It's helpful to have a deadline so that they have something to negotiate against to force them into an agreement. But most Americans agree that any debt ceiling increase should include some kind of reduction in spending. That's about a 59% issue right now. Only 24% agree with President Biden that we should have a debt ceiling with no reform, no amendments. And I think defending a 24% position is challenging. And so far, at least, Speaker McCarthy has done a very good job of strategically positioning the Republicans to be the people who are being responsible, doing the right thing, and they have significant popular support for it. Inflation continues to be a disaster. And one way to think about what's going on is the Federal Reserve is trying to slow down the economy by raising interest rates which primarily affects the private sector. Well, what the House Republicans are doing by trying to cut spending is exactly parallel. It's trying to reduce 
the government increase of demand just exactly parallel to what the Federal Reserve is doing. I think that the inflation is going to continue to be a problem. And some people who I trust believe the price of oil and gas is going to start going back up. So there are a lot of things going on, a lot of things to pay attention to. That's without even getting into China or Ukraine or all the other challenges around the world, including Iran and North Korea. I do want to remind you that my brand new book, March to the Majority, which comes out June 6th, is available now. Remind your friends that they can go to Amazon, put in March to the Majority. It says, look inside, they can click on it, and they will get a free chapter so they can read that chapter themselves at no cost. I think it's an important book because it tells you how we moved over a 16-year period to finally grow a majority, the first majority in 40 years. And then it tells you how we negotiated with Bill Clinton to get a Democratic president to sign welfare reform, the biggest tax cut, capital gains tax cut in history, and four consecutive balanced budgets. I think you'll find March the Majority is a very useful book that helps explain how to solve today's problems. And I hope you'll tell your friends about it. And I look forward very much to having you continue to be part of the Inner Circle and to join us at our next public town hall meeting will be available on Zoom.